All right. This is um, another episode from the Election Channel, blogtalkradio.com forward slash Election Channel. My name is Thomas Keegan. I'm libertarianprogressive.com, the real Election Channel. We cover everyone on the ballots. So check us out. This is also going to be uploaded on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Blast of Fresh Air. Today we're going to do an interview with Tom Wells, um, no party affiliation candidate on the ballot in District 3 in Florida for the U.S. House of Representatives. That's what we do is uh, we're an independent media organization. We interview independent third-party candidates who are on the ballot, Green Party, independents, libertarians, no party affiliation, and others. We believe if a candidate has gathered enough signatures to be on the ballot and has a statistical chance to win, then responsible media will include them in the debates and interview them, and that's what we're here to do. Our goal is to interview 50 candidates. So that's Give them a warm welcome here. I'm going to dial them in, and we're going to talk to Tom very soon, folks. We'll do an interview, and if he's up for some questions, we can do that. Tom Wells. Hi, Tom. Hey, this is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com, and you are live, sir, at blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. And how are you this September 15th, 2016? Doing fine down in Florida, CD3. Yeah, you're in district number three, I noticed, and you are on the ballot and you're running as no party affiliation. Am I correct in that? That's correct. There's right, a Democrat so, and a Republican on the ballot as well. That's right. There's a Republican and a Democrat, so you're the only alternate choice. And um, it may I ask you, are you going to be in the debates, or are there going to be debates in your area? Well, there have been a number of forums, mostly with just two of the candidates showing up. Sometimes all three of us are on stage together. All right. And now, um, I was looking at your website, uh, and uh, if people want to visit that, um, it is, let's see, Tom Wells for Congress 2016com and we have um, a list of issues here, and actually, um, when I visit a candidate's website, which I encourage people to do, I always and look to see if there's an issues list. And if there's not, I mean, that's usually disappointing, but you do have an issues list. It starts with clean air and water, health care, raising the living wage, straight arrow caucus. So if you don't mind, I guess that would be the most important substantive thing to ask is um, if you could give a uh, run through of your issues, sir, we'd love to hear about that. Well, let me start with straight arrow caucus as I've come to the conclusion it is the most fundamental issue for the country presently. Um, Presently, a lot of laws are written by corporations for corporations and are delivered to Congress along with a small bundle of money and are voted on before Congress have even a chance to read them. And the complexity and intertangledness of the legal structure that we have now after maybe 30 or 35 years of this, is overwhelming. We have constricted and and tied ourselves to different lead weights which are pulling us to the bottom. So the simplest example of that, get away from the figurative speech, is Medicare Part D, where in 2003, the pharmaceutical industry spent $100 million lobbying Congress. And in return, Congress agreed in the wording of Medicare Part D that the Medicare agency would not, on our behalf, negotiate prices with the pharmaceutical companies. Now, the VA negotiates prices, and they get a 40% lower price on average than the Medicare people do. And that amounts to roughly $100 billion per year that we just tie up and send the package to the pharmaceutical companies. They were already making quite substantial profits, and we added over the last 13 years over a trillion dollars to their take-home. That take-home comes directly from the taxpayers. And that is only a very clean but small example of the cost of congressional corruption. So the Straight Era Caucus will be my challenge to the other representatives 
to reject all corporate and large donations, including donations from the national parties, which have a propensity to bundle money from large donors and deliver it to candidates with strings attached. So as long as that's true and the, your representatives right. are dependent upon funding through corporations and major donors, it's arguable that they are representing those people rather than ourselves. Tom, I just want to say that's an excellent example. I'm sure that's just one out of thousands, if not millions of examples. I'm sure, and I did not know they paid up to $100 million to lobby Congress for that. I did hear about that. We pay, you know, probably costs in the U.S. than most other first world countries. Well, and, that um, limitation on, on, on um, negotiating prices, well, the government... I contracted in my 15 years at Georgia Tech doing R&D for the Air Force and the Army. They negotiate price on everything except for drugs under Medicare. It's an example not only of the corruption, but of the arrogance with which that corruption is undertaken. It sounds like a valiant reform effort. Um, it's called um, the Straight Caucus, or let, let me see here, Straight Arrow the Caucus. Straight Arrow Caucus. And I've heard a yes, lot of I different reforms. Yes, I would the representatives to adhere to the, uh, such constraints on their funding, and I will be proposing a uh, generous public financing option where people will be deciding which candidates get the public funds and people taking those funds will be precluded from accepting large donor corporate funding of any type. That sounds, I would say, I mean, appealing. Um, and uh, so, okay, so let's get to some of the other issues as well. I think, um, you know, just hearing you explain that, I think you said that very eloquently and started to honestly get my um blood boiling there, I just, you, you know, but I think that's a good thing. Oh, well, we're just getting started. Yeah. Uh, the single-payer health care, which Canada passed about 50 years ago, should we pass that finally, then we will damage the for-profit health insurance industry. But they have known that's coming for 50 years. They have seen that 50 other countries adopt single-payer health care and throw away the health insurance company and keep the profits to distribute among the people. So the reality is that you have to pay a little bit higher taxes, but you save a lot either by your employer not having to pay for your insurance or by you not having to pay for insurance personally. And having the benefits of that program not tied to your work, not tied to your small business, it's an immense win-win-win situation, and there is a trillion dollars available to be kept by the public that they're presently spending in excess on um, health care. The proof of that is that our health care costs per capita are about $7,500 a year, and the highest of the country is right around 4000 That 3500 translates into a trillion dollars. I am a Ph.D. in physics. I can do the numbers. Yeah, I think the next highest country is actually uh, Switzerland, and they're still like a, a lot further down than us. And I would say they probably have pretty good health care. Uh, and you did mention win, win, win. I, I mean, so you think businesses would like that as well as the general public and and doctors? Well, physicians too? really might they, they may be physicians who go into into medicine to make money, but I think most of them really care about people's health. That's yeah. hopefully the case. And I think if better I was a small health care outcome. As well, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was just saying I think a small business owner, a mid-sized business, or even a large business would probably not mind or can see some benefit in that as well. Oh. Well, let me, let me mention the overall benefit is that we have all the countries that use such a system, besides paying less money, also have significantly longer, better longevity and lower infinite mortality and um, 
maternal mortality. They have overall far better health care results. We're, in terms of statistical health care results, we're on par with Brazil, where the whole average income is not the $7,500 that we spend just on the health care segment. So we know it can be done 10 times cheaper and get just as good a result as we're getting now. There's no excuse for continuing to give money to the health care insurance companies. Now, if people who, still wanted to buy private insurance, they would be allowed to, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. As yeah. Okay. You, you would not need supplemental insurance. I mean, I was in Italy 25 years ago. Seems seems like yesterday. And I had to go to the emergency room and they treated me and I said, how am I going to pay for this? Because I was a poor boy at that time and they said, young man, this is a hospital. We don't take money. And wow. anyone who was in Italy who was sick, they went to the hospital. And that turns out to be cheaper than figuring out how much to build the insurance company. Very good. And one last thing on this is one thing that's funny that I saw is, you know how many pages the Canadian health care bill is compared to the U.S. <laughs> Affordable Care Act? I think the Canadian health care bill was like 13 pages long. Oh, that's wonderful to know. No, I did not know that. Yeah, compared to like that. the 20,000, you know, so on pages that the Affordable well, Care Act was. Well, if you was. want to hide things, you need to write long and complicated laws. Yeah. yeah. Now you had that's an awesome issue, the Straight Arrow Caucus and healthcare. Uh, you do say here raise the living wage, as well as clean air and water, and so those are the issues listed on your website. And um, and yeah, please expand on on these issues, sir. As I'm not well, actually, we're in the process of expanding yeah. that and and the website, and the clean air and water expands really to to global warming, which with my scientific background, I, I went to, I left to high school in Georgia, went to Caltech, which is kind of unusual, and studied physics, and found out that there are a whole lot of people out there who are way smarter than I am. <laughs> and a lot of them have been studying climate issues. And I believe them to be serious people. I know them to be serious people. They have the same computers and the better programs than the people who design the airplanes that we fly on. When they tell me there's global warming, I say, how much and how soon? Because it is the imminent crisis of our time. One of the first manifestations, other than the, you know, the small rises in temperature, those small rises in temperature manifest in extreme droughts in Syria, creating a refugee crisis there. In fact, there are now 65 million refugees, most of them attributable to weather changes of one type or another, which have caused farm failures and people go to large cities and they fight over scraps and we have a serious problem. That problem will only exacerbate in the next 20 so what 30 years. What should we do about global warming. That's a big issue. Well, right? the, the, we've known what we should do for at least 25 years. We should place a tax on greenhouse gases. It should be a substantial tax so that then the free market with the impetus of correctly attributing social costs to fossil fuels will resolve itself to produce a lot more solar energy and a lot more wind energy and a lot less fossil fuel energy. The greenhouse gas tax will create a very large income stream. That income stream needs to be, has to be directed to retraining people who are gainfully employed in the fossil fuel industry. And then we will also have plenty of money left to um, reduce tax burden on low income people the income tax burden. So between those issues, we won't have dislocation due to higher energy prices. Those will be covered by returning that tax money to the people. And the balance between solar, wind, and, and fossil fuels will be markedly re re redirected so that the ones that are not going to kill our children will be... Uh, preferred by the market, and it, 
is the minimal way the government can go about addressing this problem. Basically, yeah, Tom, I think um, if we uh, reinvested that money to help the poor and also to reinvest into renewables, then that might be a better pitch. Um, I mean, we are both in Florida. You're in District 3. I'm near Tampa. But, um, you, you know, it's amazing. We don't have nearly the amount of solar here in Florida as people, as the potential that we have. I mean, Germany, which is a lot higher north, um, has a lot more solar than the Sunshine State, which always boggles my mind. Um, yes, seems like I was we're going doing to mention that, that Germany on some days gets 100% of their grid power from solar, even now. And what the fossil fuel tax, greenhouse gas tax does is to uh, make it less attractive for the market to solve problems with, uh, with fossil fuels and more attractive to solve those problems with solar and uh, and wind energy. All right, and now let's. So um, one of the first victims, the first sorry. victims of uh, of that redistribution that of market forces would be fracking and tar sands oils, and so the um, North Dakota involvement with the the APL pipeline and the Sable Trails pipeline in northern Florida, those would just disappear because there would be no market for fracked gas are for tar sands oil because the energy costs, the, the greenhouse gas costs of getting those fuels is so much higher than, than any other fuels that we use. So the dirtiest fuels would be disposed of first. It's, it's an excellent capitalistic market solution. Awesome. And now, according to recent Gallup polls, most people are against fracking most people would like to see a lot more reinvestment into renewables especially solar is at the top of the list um now let's get into some of the other issues you have here i mean it's you know the straight arrow caucus that's awesome to hear about clean air and water very important well healthcare. i should mention that those are all correlated because the only reason yeah. we have not solved the um, greenhouse gas problem is that the fossil fuel industry has Book to assets, they think the oil that's under the ground is worth trillions of dollars. So they book those assets and their stock price is held up by those assets. And those assets have no actual value because they should not be used. God put them in the ground millions of years ago. Let's leave them there, what's left of them. Yeah, we don't know the long term, you know, co you know, consequences of, you know, what what they, you know, their purpose, um, how they might affect the ecosystem. Um, what about raising the living wage as well? That's uh, I remember, you know, Bernie Sanders was talking about that earlier in this campaign. I, I have many people tell me, oh, flipping burgers is not worth fifteen dollars an hour. And I say, okay, let's just let the burgers flip themselves. Because when I started working, my first job was in 1966, I think. And I was making $1.65 an hour. And nobody said, gee, God, we'll go broke. We can't, we can't pay a high school sophomore that much money to do whatever it was I was doing. No, they didn't say that you should not be able to live on, on, on a salary that you make for a job that we ask you to do. Nobody said that. But now they're saying, oh, well, minimum wage jobs shouldn't allow you enough money to live on. They should only be for people who are living at home with mommy and daddy and, and working just because they want to learn how to work. And what are they going to learn how to work from? They're going to learn that work does not pay enough for you to live? That's, that's to me... Not what my father taught me. He taught me that if a job was worth doing, it should be, it should earn respect, and respect is to be able to live without needing welfare. And oh yes, by doing that, you get rid of pretty much all the welfare that we're paying in this country. It's mm, much more wow. fair for the people who are eating the burgers that got flipped to be paying for the people who flipped them. Yeah, actually, you would probably get rid of a lot of welfare, wouldn't you? And um, and if if in minimum wage kept up with inflation, I think it would be about ten sixty five an hour right now. And in recent Gallup polls, um, seventy six percent of Americans on the left and the right, just seventy six percent of people, do support 
raising the minimum wage, another 67% um, support and inflation and adjusted minimum oh, wage. Yeah. And sure. um, of course. Now, Tom, well, I mean, the I only can... reason that the cost of living increases is because people are paying more for the stuff that they're getting. And it doesn't make sense to ask that people pay more while you pay them the same amount. It, now, if you don't mind, if I might go through like kind of a what we call here just a quick round of a couple issues and just to get some quick thoughts, I have about 10 issues here. I'd just like to just hear, okay. um, you know, just kind of a, your thoughts on them. And um, thank you. So we'll just start with um, accountability and transparency. What 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 say you about that? Well, I think government sh- should be transparent. Um, one of the heinous examples presently is the um, free. Hard to even say free trade when you know that it means exactly the opposite. TPP is the current candidate for a free trade agreement with the Pacific Rim nations and. That free trade negoti- pact was negotiated in secret over several years by only corporate representatives. Our congressmen and senators were not allowed to see the text of it or to have copies of the text. It's a secret pact, and they could see the text of it if they went into a private building and did not take a pencil of paper or any recording device and just read the complex language that corporate lawyers wrote over a period of six years and then they weren't supposed to talk to their colleagues about what they thought about it. This is not how you negotiate a trade agreement. A trade agreement should be public from day one. I propose an alternative that you have a fair trade agreement negotiated by union members around the world and responsive to the needs of people. That sounds great. Tom. That's only the borderline of accountability. Um, when we have an NSA, General Clapper is the director of the NSA, I believe, mm-hmm. or, ha- or was at the time I, I knew this, going to Congress and deciding how much truth he can tell them and not telling them the truth because he thought it might jeopardize national security for our Congress to know what our government is doing that is reprehensible. That is Absolutely. not. And that was one of my other issues. So I'm glad that you touched on that one. All right. And what about, um, let's just say, justice system? Um, any thoughts on the current justice system? Well, it does very. To, to be generous, you'd have to say that the uh, justice system is applied unequally to the rich and the poor. Um, one of the most immediate and pressing problem in my mind is that the rate of police killing of unarmed blacks is almost the same rate as we had of lynchings back before the 50s. I think the last public lynching in Georgia was in 54 when I was four years old and busloads of tourists on charter buses came up to watch the lynching of four black men here. Now we have police shooting unarmed black men and Oh, Lordy, I'm, more than 90% of the police are, enter the force and intend to do excellent work. And mm-hmm. the fact that the police investigate themselves is, I think, the core issue here. No no institution yeah. should be allowed to investigate itself. So Yeah, most don't. If I make actually. it to Congress, I would propose that any use of a weapon by police be investigated as a federal incident to determine by investigation if a crime has been committed. Excellent, excellent. And let's get to, um, and and that's a really good uh, point there, and uh, what about election reform? Do do you think we need any election reform as far as, um, you know, like for U.S. Congress, etc.? Well, yes. We, um, in my estimation, following very closely the primary season because I was very much inspired by Bernie Sanders' run. Everything about the primary system is is corrupt. And parts of those things carry into the general election. The lack of confidence in voting machines is, Mm -hmm. I think, well-justified and well-documented, their hackability. 
And at this point, it really seems that you should have a paper trail for for all voting. Um, the alternative, which as as a as a technical person, you should have open source software rather than proprietary software in your voting machine. So both sides can look and examine the software and test it under various scenarios and be assured that it is uncorruptible. That's not a difficult Absolutely. thing, but so far we've managed not to do that in more than 20 years of using voting machines. Well, so excellent if we point aren't going to do that, we have to make a paper trail. Oregon has universal mail-in ballots. That's one solution. The Okay. Aspiration to find voter fraud, where voters have tried to vote twice, or some other, or non-citizen voters have tried to vote. Yeah, we are passing laws in all the Republican-dominated states, which assume that that's happening. But when they try to find any instances, they usually find one in 20, 20 million votes. Which doesn't determine a lot of a lot of uh, elections, as you're probably aware. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's very true. If you look at the stats, uh, I mean, the type of things that the Republicans usually say are, you know, they want to check the identities, which I'm not necessarily against, but they, it's it's that's not the major priority right now. Um, and I think most people agree that there should be a paper trail, of course. So, what about? Um, Small and mid-sized businesses. Do you think there's anything that we could do to help small and mid-sized businesses in this current well, day and age? Let's look at what the uh, principal cause of small business failure is, and that actually, surprisingly, is the health of the proprietor. And the way that works is that the small business gets a small business health insurance program, and the for-profit industry insurance industry wants to make a profit off each group. So if the proprietor of the business or his wife or his children has some chronic disease which is expensive to treat but not debilitating, he finds that his premiums go up the second year by exactly the amount to cover the cost of treating his disease or his family's disease. So you don't actually have insurance except the first year. And the, yeah, that's the significant cause of business, business failure, but the undocumented part of that is that if you have an employee with a similar situation, you have to fire him because you can't afford the extra $100,000 a year in insurance premium that his ill health is costing you. This does not happen in a single-payer health care system where we, the people, have decided that we are each individually worth taking care of, and it doesn't matter if you have a job or not. So, there's so no excellent such point. And I think um, a living wage might help small businesses because they might have more customers as well that can afford oh, absolutely, their. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I've, I've had people tell me that, oh, I, yeah, it's fine for big companies, but small companies can afford that. If you're selling donuts, there's a lot more people who can afford donuts if you're paying, uh, if everybody around you is getting $15 an hour at a minimum. Yep. The now let's go to the next other way of here. looking at oh, the uh, minimum wage and, uh, um, contradistinction to your observation of the inflation adjusted minimum wage is the uh, productivity scale. So if we take mm -hmm. 1968 as a scale of 100, in terms of uh, productivity per labor hour. Well, the productivity per labor hour is now 250. So each labor hour unit cost is only 40% of what it is was in 1968. I have to, I have to try and excuse myself for inaccurate Wording yeah, well, here. people are more productive nowadays. I mean, costs as they were before. That seems to exponentially be growing up on the charts. Oh, yeah, and looks who should charts. be getting the rewards of that productivity? Yes, there are machines that make people more productive, but you have to have some skill to use the machines. And if you don't have people 
benefiting from their productivity, then all the wealth accumulates in a very, very small number of bank accounts. Now, I do want to ask you this. Um, just anything if you want to cover on any local issues pertaining to your specific district. And also, you're running as a non-party affiliation. So if you have a pitch out there, per se, to say to Republicans, Democrats, the majority of the people who are, you know, independents, um, you know, just a broad general uh, election, what would you say to Republicans and Democrats and people who are not uh, affiliated with any party um, to your district? Well, let me let me mention that I have been uh, pretty much a lifelong Democrat. I, I made a mistake back in 72 and voted for Richard Nixon because I couldn't imagine anybody would be so stupid as what the Democrats were claiming as to jeopardize his election by breaking into a Democratic Party headquarters. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Nixon was impeached, and people have done far worse than that without being impeached since. But yeah. despite being a, a lifelong Democrat, I am running as an independent because Florida is the most expensive state to uh, run as a congressman anyway. And the D beside your name costs an extra $3,500. The independent costs 7000 which is enough. But that's what's needed to get on the ballot when the previous Democrat drops out with only a, a week before the qualifying deadline. So there I am. And to to address the other parts of your question, if I can keep them in mind closely enough, uh, I think that the people who are supporting Donald Trump generally recognize that there's something wrong going on in the country. And I think that thing is government corruption is entangled and constraining manifestations and uh, all the gifting that we give to corporations. So I think they're misidentifying the problem, but that they understand that there is a problem which I am trying to address. And I believe that message communicates pretty clearly that if we get people to stop taking corporate money and start working for the people, we will all be better off. Yeah, and I think... Go ahead. I was was just going to say, I think talking about congressional politics is not quite as divisive as presidential politics. So maybe someone out there is voting for Trump as a lesser of two evils. Doesn't mean that they cannot support you. They certainly could. Um, so we're talking about Congress well, I've been here. been Trump and, rallies, and a lot of the people yeah. there supported me. Absolutely. And, um, and it would be nice to see some unity, actually, in this. And you know what kind of message it would send to Congress to have a no-party-affiliated person uh, be sent to Congress, that would um, t- tell a message to the status quo. And I, you know, so that could be a, um, ha- you know, you would be representing the largest voting block out there, which is people who are independents, whether they lean one way or another, per se. Let me ask you this. Well, in my uh, congressional district, only about 20% of the people are, are without party affiliation, so, which is unusual nationwide. That's closer to 40% nationwide, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually uh, the biggest block. I think it's 42% and then 26% is Democrat, or 28% is Democrat, 26% is Republican. And, of course, there's less than 1% who's the special interest. Uh, so regarding, um, if you could tell us just uh, on a more personal level, who are some of your favorite past or present people who have been elected or not and why? Well, I've loved, for a long time at married Jimmy Carter. Um, one of the attributes of his presidency was that we didn't go to war with anybody. And that is another enormous economic and and psychological pressure on this country. So, yeah, we could do another two or three hours on on the Department of Defense and the manifestations of defense which are not defending us, particularly the arming of independent for-profit contractors in war zones and the complete lack of supervision thereof, meaning that specifically there are no legal constraints upon their actions whatsoever. They are not 
constrained by civil or military law of our own or of the host nations. So they can literally kill people, and that has to stop because that is not the America that I think any one of us wishes to 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 imagine at any point before and after this day. Yeah, I know a lot of people had criticized Carter um, in the past, but actually on a re-review of history and the long run, how history judges someone, I think a lot of people are seeing Carter as, you know, pretty good. And um, and he's been excellent after office, I mean, with his Habitat for Humanity, definitely a, a man of peace. And, and the Carter you Foundation know, has spent far more than the Clinton Foundation on far, far less money. They have yeah, almost I, eliminated are on the verge of completely eliminating from the world the guinea worm disease, which is a horrible way to die, and which was very widespread in countries with no clean water. Well, Tom, we'd love to see you get into Washington. I mean, when I hear, you know, your words here and your passion behind what you're saying, I mean, this is, I think, what the founders intended, you know, when they had set up the House of Representatives to be the people's house. And I certainly hope no matter what side, part of the spectrum that you're in, you found this interview to be uh, insightful, delightful, and, and you found someone here who is on the ballot, Florida's District 3 in the U.S. House of Representatives, that um, you know, you'd want to look more into. So any f- final thoughts here, Tom? And, uh, and we do thank you for your time here. A lot of other candidates well, wouldn't even take the time. Thank you for the time and the exposure. The final thought, if I might be so bold, is to say that Right now we have people who talk about working across the aisle and um, they're talking about Democratic and Republican Party aisle and I don't see that as a problem. I see the problem that that aisle is dividing one set of corporations from another set of corporations. And if we get to move the aisle over to where it's between conservatives and liberals, I think we will have made real progress towards having a well-functioning and prosperous country because the distinction between conservative and liberal in the traditional sense is between people who believe in known proven solutions and people who think that you better and wish to, to, to challenge the existing norms. The existing norms are what are single-payer health care and reasonable minimum wages where anybody who works diligently can have children and a place to live and not be on the street and not be visiting the welfare office. So, yes, it's um, a large question if we can get our Congress to start representing us, I believe. Yeah, well, um, it something will give. And uh, so the Congress was put there to, you know, it's elected every two years. I believe the founders made it the easiest house the easiest um, branch of government, you know, where we can make that difference. And so encourage people to, you know, get involved here. And, um, well, Tom, it's been good talking with you today. Uh, I'll send you a link uh, via email to this interview. And, um, you know, if we have some time before November 8th, uh, Election Day, you know, maybe we can do a follow-up interview. But uh, it's been an absolute pleasure and um, and best wishes, uh going forward well, thank here. you and i would very much look forward to a continuation there's no end of topics to discuss we haven't touched on intellectual property and the extensions of of it and the yeah the abuses of that system among many many others yeah but they all come back to the corporate corruption and the money in congress when people right. start using those criteria to deselect congressmen and help them find other gainful employment then we'll have made some progress. Well, that sounds absolutely awesome. And uh, well, take care, Thomas, and uh, and best wishes uh, in your campaign, sir. And look forward well, thank to you, sir. hearing about you I in the news. A, I think you are a tremendous help to that, and I much appreciate your call. All right, take care, sir.